Good morning, everybody. Uh, whether here in the auditorium or online, uh, welcome to the Wilson Center. I'm Andrew Redman, the director of the Mexico Institute, and it's our great pleasure to welcome you to uh, the kickoff of our 11th annual security conference. Security is, of course, one of the most pressing issues in the U.S.-Mexico bilateral relationship, and it likely will be for the foreseeable future. The 100,000 deaths from opioids in the United States, uh, primarily from fentanyl in the last year, makes drug trafficking a significant domestic issue. In Mexico, drug cartel violence, often using weapons procured from the United States, places innocent civilians in harm's way, and undermines Mexico's ability to attract investment essential for economic growth and development. Addressing these and other related challenges, which confront our governments and societies, requires cross-border collaboration. Our governments have committed under the Bicentennial Framework to such collaboration in recognition of the shared challenges. Just a note, we had hoped to have the opportunity to hear from senior officials from both governments this morning. Scheduling difficulties prevented that from happening today, but we're going to continue to, to be in contact with them and hope that we can do that sometime soon. When we talk about security, we shouldn't limit ourselves to focusing solely on drug cartels and cross-border flows of drugs and weapons. It's equally important to talk about personal security for Mexicans, frequently identified as the number one concern of voters in the upcoming Mexican election. The high rates of impunity and of violence, including against journalists and against women, and rising reports of extortion impact the daily lives of Mexican citizens countrywide. During our conference, spread out over two days and combining in-person and virtual platforms, we'll address both the international and the domestic aspects of security. Our speakers and panels will focus on the challenges facing both countries, separately and collectively, and on possible solutions to reduce or eliminate the threats to our peace, prosperity, and security. We'll kick off this morning with a presentation by Pablo Vasquez, Secretary of Citizen Security of Mexico City, who I'll introduce momentarily. Secretary Vasquez will provide a real-time perspective on how Mexican public officials respond to the diversity of threats to public security. Following the Secretary's remarks, former U.S. Ambassador to Mexico and current Wilson Center Public Policy Fellow, Ambassador Earl Anthony Wayne, will moderate a panel on strategies to combat illicit trafficking. It's important to recall that the cartels and other criminal organizations will traffic anything for which there is an illicit market. We hope that in discussing several of these products, we can identify some commonalities of strategy and best practice. 2024 is, as I mentioned, an election year in Mexico and in the United States, of course. Tomorrow will be entirely virtual for a panel that will look at the security challenges facing Mexico's next president, whomever she or he may be. We subsequently hope to host representatives of the campaigns to hear about their plans and strategies once the campaign officially begins, uh, effective this Friday, March 1st. In addition, we have several analytical pieces on security issues on our Elections Guide uh, website, which can be found at mexicoelections.wilsoncenter.org. Now, with apologies to our translators for switching in the middle, Es ahora mi gran placer de presentar al Secretario de Seguridad Ciudadanía de la Ciudad de México, Pablo Vázquez. El Secretario asumió su cargo hace seis meses. Previamente ocupó la titularidad de la Subsecretaria de Participación Ciudadana y Prevención del Delito, desde donde impulsó la implementación de programas de prevención y reducción de la violencia como Alto al Fuego y Reconecta con la Paz. Antes de esta responsabilidad, ocupó diversos cargos en el gobierno federal, como encargado de la Unidad de Prevención de la Violencia y el Delito de la Secretaria de Seguridad y Protección Ciudadana del Gobierno de México, Director General de Prevención del Delito y Servicios a la Comunidad de la Subprocuraduría de Derechos Humanos de la Procuraduría General de la República, y director de investigación y estrategias para la prevención social de la Subsecretaria de Prevención y Participación Ciudadana en la Secretaría de Gobernación. Antes de incorporarse en el servicio público, Maestro Vázquez estuvo al frente de distintos proyectos de prevención de lavado de dinero, identificación y manejo de riesgos operativos e inteligencia en el sector privado. 
Tiene un licenciado en Relaciones Internacionales por el Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México, donde, si no me equivoco, fue alumno de nuestro vicepresidente Duncan Wood. Una tiene también una maestría en Política Criminal por la Escuela de Economía y Ciencia Política de Londres y cuenta con estudios de especialización en delincuencia organizada en Sicilia y Macedonia. Su bio completa está disponible en la página web para este evento. Con esto, secretario, bienvenido en forma virtual al Wilson Center y adelante con su presentación. Thank you very much for the introduction. I will switch briefly to Spanish. Just wanted to thank the Mexico Institute and the Wilson Center for the invite and all the attendants for sharing your time to uh, uh, listen and, and to comment on what Mexico City has done in terms of security in the last five years with a strategy that I will re refer briefly that was first implemented uh, by Dr. Sheinbaum, now uh, one of the candidates to the presidency, and that it's being continued now by, by the chief of government, uh, Marti Batres, uh, and a strategy that was implemented uh, in close connection with the government, the federal government, and of course, local governments. I'll, I'll switch to Spanish. Um, I, I want to thank also and, and congratulate myself and, and the rest of the panelists uh, for this for this session. Kathleen, Austin, Jim Vivenso, and of course, Raul Benitez, a dear friend and, and, and mentor. It's an honor to share the panel and also thanking uh, Duncan Wood. Uh, I was indeed, in fact, his student uh, back in the day in the ITAM. Me voy a referir entonces rápidamente a la estrategia de seguridad que se implementó en la Ciudad de México, solo como siempre confirmando que se pueda ver la, la pantalla. Sí, podemos Gracias. verlo. Gracias. La estrategia de la Ciudad de México eh, que diseñó, como decía en su momento la doctora Claudia Sheinbaum, consiste en cuatro pilares principales <coughs> expresados en la pantalla, quizá en su versión más sencilla y didáctica, y me referiré a cada uno de ellos y después presentaré algunos resultados que se han obtenido. El primero es el que referimos comúnmente como atención a las causas. Es un pilar eh, que va un poco más allá de lo que se ha trabajado generalmente como prevención del delito. Es un pilar que cree, en primer lugar, parte del convencimiento de que muchos de los problemas delictivos, sobre todo de la eh, perpetuación de problemas delictivos a lo largo del tiempo, tienen que ver muchas veces con factores estructurales, con desigualdad, con exclusión y con la falta de acceso de las personas a servicios y programas que les permitan o les permiten garantizar derechos, entre ellos el derecho a la justicia. En este eje nos hemos centrado mucho en la atención a jóvenes, jóvenes eh, en varias dimensiones. Eh, por ejemplo, se ha trabajado mucho en la educación de las personas en la Ciudad de México, garantizando que desde la educación maternal hasta la universidad haya un, una línea, un continuo de servicios gratuitos y universales para los jóvenes que puedan acceder a educación, insisto, desde las primeras etapas hasta la universidad, se han construido universidades, se ha ampliado el acceso al bachillerato, se ha trabajado mucho con la Secretaría de Educación Pública Federal, que al final tiene la rectoría de la educación básica, en eh, darle beca a los jóvenes y a las niñas, a los niños, para que no abandonen estudios. Esto sobre todo también en un momento que se vivió en todo el mundo, como fue la pandemia, cuando eh, se combatió el abandono escolar con estos incentivos económicos a la economía familiar, estas becas que se le daban a los niños, eh, se ha eh, puesto en marcha un sistema de educación comunitaria, que son los pilares donde se puede acceder a eh, educación técnica, a formación en oficios, eh, que no necesariamente es eh, educación académica. Son eh, instalaciones de, de altísima calidad, de arquitectura eh, muy buena, que están presentes sobre todo en barrios con altos índices de marginación e inseguridad y distintos programas que van dirigidos eh, ya de manera más focalizada a jóvenes en altos niveles de riesgo, eh, con mucha evidencia, informados por mucha evidencia. Uno es Jóvenes Unen al Barrio, que es una transferencia monetaria a jóvenes para que se incorporen a distintas actividades. 
eh, otro que este lo coordina específicamente la Secretaría de Seguridad Ciudadana y es eh, impartido por policías, que se llama Reconecta con la Paz. Es lo que se conoce en inglés como un Pre-Trial Diversion Program. Eh, lo que hacemos es que en vez de que vayan a juicio los jóvenes, eh, cumplen una medida en libertad para no ir a juicio justamente después de haber sido detenidos por delitos menores y trabajamos con ellos con intervenciones cognitivo-conductuales para desmovilizar violencia y abatir reincidencia. Este programa en específico, con una evaluación de impacto que tenemos, nos ha permitido establecer que, la, que los chavos que han entrado a Reconecta tienen una probabilidad 10 veces menor de reincidir delictivamente que el mismo grupo de jóvenes o un grupo estadísticamente similar de jóvenes que no entró a este programa. En fin, son muchas iniciativas que, insisto, buscan eh, abatir la exclusión, abatir la desigualdad, eh, dar eh, programas, servicios informados por evidencia que le permitan a la gente ejercer derechos. Sería la forma, eh, digamos, más sintética de ponerlo. Lo siguiente es el eje de más y mejor policía. Este es un eje de desarrollo institucional que puso mucho de su acento en la construcción o en el fortalecimiento de la policía de la Ciudad de México. La corporación eh, que tengo el honor de encabezar cuenta ahorita contando la policía preventiva, que es la policía regular que todo el mundo ve en la calle y lo que llamamos policías complementarias que proveen servicios eh, bajo contrato o bajo convenio. Es una fuerza de 86 mil personas aproximadamente. Eh, quizá el elemento eh, más importante a destacar aquí es que como nunca antes en estos cinco años eh, se pudo subir el ingreso de los policías, aumentarles el sueldo de manera significativa, en términos nominales se ha dado un aumento del 68% al sueldo de los policías. La Ciudad de México pasó de ser una de las peores policías pagadas, eh, policías estatales peor pagadas, a la cuarta mejor pagada del país. Eh, y, en, y, y no se necesita mucho más para colocarse ya como la mejor policía estatal pagada del país. Eh, eh, había un rezago importante, sobre todo considerando el costo de vida en la Ciudad de México en términos de salario, pero se han hecho otras cosas, se ha batido el déficit de personal, se ha mejorado el proceso de reclutamiento, se ha mejorado la capacitación continua a los policías, se han diseñado dos perfiles de ingreso a la policía que no se tenían, eh, que tiene que ver con el siguiente eje de la estrategia, que es tener el perfil de ingreso regular, el perfil de investigación e inteligencia que no se tenía y ahí se pide un nivel de educación mínimo de licenciatura y también al haber recibido el sistema penitenciario tenemos un perfil de ingreso de especialista en custodia penitenciaria. Y después viene mucha capacitación continua, la que exige el Sistema Nacional de Seguridad Pública, pero también eh, hemos puesto un acento importante en la formación internacional. Como nunca antes, la Policía de la Ciudad de México se ha beneficiado de cursos impartidos por eh, instituciones del extranjero o bien enviado policías al extranjero a una veintena de países diferentes en distintas especialidades. Esto se complementa desde luego con un gran trabajo que se ha hecho en términos de reducir brechas de desigualdad al interior de la policía. Hay más mandos mujeres, hay más personal femenino en general, eh, hace un año prácticamente se graduó la primera generación de nuestra universidad donde había más mujeres que hombres en, el, en los reclutas. Se ha también eh, creado una unidad especial, de hecho que acabamos de eh, acompañar una iniciativa en el Congreso para fortalecerla, pero en el 2019 se creó una unidad, que, eh, una suerte como de unidad de asuntos internos específicamente para el tema de violencia contra las mujeres por razones de género al interior de la institución y ahora la fortaleceremos y la convertiremos en una unidad de política pública para lograr igualdad sustantiva al interior de la, de la corporación. Hay muchos más eh, desarrollos. Creo la Ciudad de México ha fortalecido un, una triada de funciones eh, institucionales que son básicas para la operación de una policía estatal, sobre todo en el contexto de nuestro país, que es tener cuerpos muy fuertes de analistas tácticos, cuerpos muy fuertes de investigadores y cuerpos muy fuertes de eh, personal especializado en operaciones especiales, en intervenciones urbanas. El siguiente eje, ya lo adelanto con algunos de los elementos, es el de inteligencia e investigación. La Secretaría de Seguridad Ciudadana recibió en el año 2020 ya de manera formal, con una iniciativa que se presentó en 2019, la capacidad de investigar. Es una de las pocas policías que tiene formalizada esta capacidad, que no está sujeta a interpretaciones de los artículos constitucionales, sino se puso en blanco y negro 
la facultad de investigar, apoyando desde luego al Ministerio Público, quien mantiene eh, eh, como está a nivel constitucional el mando y conducción de las investigaciones, pero se le dio a la policía la capacidad de investigar preventivamente, esa es, eh, digamos, la, la, la atribución específica, eh, y con esto eh, nos hemos vuelto más útiles para el Ministerio Público. La policía conduce investigaciones que le notifica a, de manera preventiva, conduce investigaciones que le notifica por noticia criminal para que se abra una carpeta al Ministerio Público, o bien el Ministerio Público, después de haber abierto una carpeta, tiene ahora la posibilidad de darle vista a la Secretaría de Seguridad Ciudadana, o puesto en español más sencillo, eh, pedirle a la Secretaría de Seguridad Ciudadana que le apoye en la investigación de ciertos, de ciertos casos. Y eso, eh, sin meternos en argumentos ya de, de calidad o en valoraciones sobre la calidad de las investigaciones, solamente a nivel aritmético eh, eh, lo podemos traducir en que en este momento en la Ciudad de México cerca de cuatro veces más policías investigan delitos que los que lo hacían al inicio de la administración en 2018 y 2019. Eh, no quiere decir que los 86 mil policías investiguen casos completos, pero sí que hay áreas eh, que se han creado dentro de la Secretaría que investigan casos completos, que, lo investig que investigan casos por especialidad de delito, secuestro, extorsión, alta incidencia, que son los delitos de propiedad, alto impacto, eh, tenemos especialidades, o sea, áreas especializadas en investigación de campo, a, como decía, en análisis táctico, y eh, además... Eh, ¿Cómo se llaman? Las personas que están desplegadas en campo, los policías que están desplegados en campo, eh, llevan a cabo actos de investigación que no llevaban antes, que se integran a las, a las investigaciones iniciadas a nivel central. Esto desde luego ha permitido reducir eh, significativamente los niveles de impunidad en la ciudad. Eh, quizá si medimos impunidad bajo una eh, medición simple, donde vemos a cada carpeta o a cada delito ha habido una sanción, este, no se ve tan reflejada la reducción en, en los niveles de impunidad, pero si lo vemos eh, de manera más estratégica y, por ejemplo, hablamos de cuántas personas que han ejercido violencia o que nosotros sabemos por inteligencia que ejercen violencia están detenidas, a veces no necesariamente por el delito, eh, el homicidio que cometieron, pero sí por algún otro delito como extorsión o eh, delitos relacionados con drogas, vemos que eh, se ha eh, logrado eh, llevar a prisión a muchas personas generadoras de violencia. Se ha usado este eh, identificador, digamos, eh, para eh, poder ilustrar el trabajo. Eh, a muchos generadores de violencia se les ha llevado a, a prisión y sus casos o los casos de, eh, ya específicos de violencia pues, se siguen investigando. Y finalmente el tema de la coordinación, eh, lo que ha sido fundamental en la Ciudad de México es la integración operativa prácticamente entre la Fiscalía y la Policía. No es algo eh, que se haya visto en el pasado en la Ciudad de México y que muchas veces no se ve en el territorio, en el resto del territorio, donde eh, en gran medida gracias a estas facultades de investigación que recibió la Policía eh, podemos tener un trabajo coordinado y más útil y completamente integrado con la Fiscalía. Eh, quizá mencionando la institución más importante en este eje de coordinación, pero con otras instituciones que han sido muy importantes del gobierno de México, Centro Nacional de Inteligencia, eh, la, eh, la Sedena, Guardia Nacional, la Marina, y desde luego también integrando mucho del trabajo territorial eh, social en procesos eh, de diseño de programas que tienen ambas herramientas, lo social y lo disuasivo, integradas y que comparten mucha información entre estas estrategias. Una de ellas se mencionaba, la de Alto al Fuego, que es una adaptación de la operación Ceasefire que se llevó a cabo en varias ciudades de Estados Unidos, se ha llevado a la Ciudad de México con éxito, eh, con acompañamiento incluso de organizaciones eh, de la sociedad civil en Estados Unidos, del California Partnership for Safe Communities, eh, Innovations for Poverty Action y otras con las que hemos trabajado. Eh, esos son los ejes de la, de la estrategia. Y me permito presentar algunos de los, de los resultados en términos de delitos de alto impacto. Esto es un conjunto de 10 delitos que medimos desde el inicio de la administración. Son 10, 12 delitos eh, que tienen impacto ya sea por el nivel de violencia o eh, el impacto en la rutina de las personas. Tenemos homicidio, lesiones, extorsión, violación, robo a transeúnte, robo a conductor, 
eh, tenemos eh, robo de vehículo con y sin violencia. El agregado de estos delitos, que son los delitos, digamos, más importantes eh, en términos de percepción y de daño a la sociedad, eh, en, en, justamente en enero de este año, que es el último corte que tenemos, registraron su nivel más bajo desde que se tiene registro en esta administración o en administraciones anteriores. Tenemos un promedio de diario de 52 delitos de este tipo en la ciudad o de carpetas abiertas por estos delitos, para ser más específico, contra 151 que se tenían al inicio de la administración. Estos son los delitos, algunos de los delitos que están en este, en este compendio. Eh, hay unos que han tenido reducciones muy, muy importantes y muchos delitos que en efecto se vieron favorecidos por el periodo de la pandemia, eh, eh, sufriendo reducciones importantes en ese, en ese periodo. Son delitos que están muy relacionados a la actividad económica en el espacio público, pero se han mantenido las reducciones a lo largo, a lo largo del tiempo, o sea, post pandemia, ya con reactivación económica. Esta es eh, la gráfica de, de homicidios. Eh, es una, eh, una reducción eh, contra enero del año, de este año también, comparando enero contra enero de 2019-2024, de 58%, pasamos de casi cinco homicidios en promedio diarios al inicio de la administración a dos, que es el promedio diario que hemos mantenido sostenido ya desde hace varios meses. Enero de 2024 fue el cuarto mes con menos homicidios de la administración. En 2022 se tuvo un mes eh, incluso menor, con 1.6, y ese mes eh, es, es el, el más bajo eh, empatado con alguno que se tuvo en años previos, eh, por ahí de, de 2005-2006. Esta reducción en la violencia homicida en la Ciudad de México para una metrópoli eh, de estas características en Latinoamérica es en, en muchos sentidos excepcional y eh, ha habido, eh, me lo refiero eh, de una vez eh, antes, eh, mucho debate sobre si estas cifras por eh, eh, ciertas inconsistencias que hay con la medición que tiene INEGI, con la que tiene la Fiscalía. Eh, en lo que estamos viendo, se creó un grupo de trabajo para atender ese tema. No hay eh, ninguna, o se ha querido dar a entender que, que ha habido eh, ocultamiento o que se están modificando las cifras. No es el caso. La INEGI trabaja con certificados de defunción. Esto que están viendo son carpetas de investigación y lo que sí hemos detectado es que hay eh, mala comunicación entre investigaciones concluidas donde se acredita que el evento en efecto fue un homicidio doloso y el certificado de defunción donde en la Ciudad de México, a diferencia de otros estados, quien elabora el certificado de defunción, que, que es el sector salud eh, y posteriormente eh, quienes hacen las necropsias, no están catalogando los eventos en ese momento como dolosos cuando tienen duda sobre si fue doloso o no y esperan a que las investigaciones lo concluyan, y hay una, un retardo en la actualización entre la, en la conclusión de las investigaciones y los certificados de defunción. Pero son dos mediciones que miden cosas distintas, unos son carpetas de investigación, los otros son certificados de defunción, eso explica muchas de las discrepancias, y en ambos casos la tendencia se sostiene, son eh, dejando un poco el detalle de las magnitudes, tenemos en la Ciudad de México en los últimos años una reducción, eh, eh, muy, muy importante después de haber venido de uno de los periodos más violentos en la historia de la Ciudad de México, que es el que inició con el ascenso en, la, en el índice de homicidios en 2016. Otros, eh, otros delitos que suelen tener cifras negras bajas, el robo de vehículos sin violencia en mínimos históricos, eh, sin violencia y con violencia en mínimos históricos. Y finalmente, algo que nos permite... Eh, eh, a nosotros ver reflejado el trabajo y darnos cuenta de que, no neces eh, que, que los registros oficiales eh, tienen un eco en lo que percibe la gente, pues es el, el tema de percepción de seguridad en la ciudad, que si bien en términos absolutos hablar de que poco más del 50% de la gente sigue percibiendo inseguridad y eso nos, eh, nos invita a seguir trabajando de manera ar ardua, eh, bajo la medición que hace el INEGI, la ENSU, la encuesta de seguridad urbana, al inicio de la administración estábamos hablando de que cerca de nueve de cada diez personas en la ciudad se sentían inseguras. Eh, esto se ha reducido a cinco de cada diez en los últimos años. Esto, desde luego, en, cons en consonancia con la reducción en las carpetas de investigación. Lo mismo ha sucedido con la victimización. Si vemos el último dato que se tiene de victimización del ENVIPEC, que es el referente a 2022, 
vemos también una tendencia a la baja en los últimos años en la victimización. Quizá eh, este es el dato de incidencia delictiva más sólido que puede haber, donde se dirime si hay o no cifra negra. Obviamente las magnitudes cambian por lo mismo, pero eh, a, al preguntarle a la gente si ha sido víctima de delitos en los últimos años, eh, vemos que 2022 está reflejando los niveles que se tenían en 2012 eh, en esta encuesta, que son los más bajos que se tienen desde que se levanta la encuesta de victimización del INEGI. Lo mismo en términos de prevalencia de incidencia y de prevalencia delictiva medido por la encuesta de victimización. Eh, como decía, se han tomado distintas medidas eh, importantes para atender el tema específico de la violencia contra las mujeres por razones de género. Hay una reducción en feminicidios. Vemos también que la victimización medida por Envipe de, 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 en términos de violación, por ejemplo, ha bajado, aunque las carpetas por violación han subido. Ahí tenemos un claro caso de un delito con mucha cifra negra donde ésta se ha reducido en parte porque hay más y mejores mecanismos para denunciar el delito y otros resultados que con gusto les, les compartiremos y de esto se ha visto también reflejado en una disminución en la percepción de inseguridad ya específicamente de las mujeres en la Ciudad de México pasando eh, en los últimos años, hubo un repunte en los primeros años, en los últimos años desde 2021 que es cuando empieza todos los programas eh, a tomar fuerza en la ciudad a, a la fecha donde se ha registrado eh, el nivel de percepción que ven, que ven ahí. En síntesis, una estrategia de cuatro pilares interconectados entre ellos eh, con una apuesta muy importante a la investigación que ha podido eh, ofrecer estos resultados y que exige de mucha continuidad para eh, eh, poder mantener y profundizar lo que, ha, lo que se ha logrado. Cuando hablamos de una estrategia, ¿a qué nos referimos con una estrategia? Pues es una iteración de procesos eh, exitosos y de procesos desde luego que son siempre perfectibles pero que necesitan continuidad y, y consolidarse para seguir siendo efectivos. Muchas gracias. Gracias, señor secretario, y felicidades por, por los éxitos que, que presentó uh, sobre su estrategia de, de los últimos años. Uh, no tenemos mucho tiempo, sé que, que tiene una agenda complicada también, pero si, si, si puedo uh, hacer solamente un, una pregunta y me pregunto, uh, dado la, lo, los éxitos, los resultados que, que ha mostrado para la Ciudad de México, si ¿sí hay la posibilidad de compartir buenas prácticas, de implementar esas estrategias en, en otros estados, otras partes de, del país? Yo creo que sí, sin duda. Eh, obviamente el país es muy diverso, cada territorio tiene... Eh, características y complejidades. Lo mismo sucede en la ciudad, no es lo mismo una alcaldía central con eh, incluso hasta una orografía distinta a las del sur. Creo que vamos siempre a tener eso, pero hay principios que pueden adaptarse eh, a nivel local sin duda eh, y elementos de la estrategia que pueden tener una traducción o una trasplantación a distintas entidades eh, siendo exitosos. Creo que algo, lo primero que tenemos que pensar en México es dejar quizá de, de hablar de una estrategia general global y empezar a pensar en estrategias particulares a nivel local, obviamente articuladas, ayudadas, eh, integradas desde, desde, desde el centro, desde la, desde la federación. ¿Qué ha sido exitoso en la Ciudad de México? Eh, apostar eh, por la parte social con una perspectiva de universal, una perspectiva de inclusión, una perspectiva de cuidado, y una, eh, eso combinado además con programas altamente focalizados eh, e informados por mucha evidencia. La, ambas cosas, eh, digamos, la lógica de, detrás de un estado de bienestar combinado con una eh, lógica de focalización eh, eh, muy puntual en lo social, creo que ha sido muy, muy útil. Ha sido muy útil también apostar por la investigación, poner a la investigación en el centro de la estrategia de seguridad, en este caso potenciando las capacidades de la policía, no es la única respuesta, es una respuesta desde luego eh, que ha rendido frutos el, el darle capacidad a la policía de investigar y dentro de lo que, del, del gran conjunto de acciones que puede implicar investigar o cuando hablamos de investigar, eh, también eso operacionalizarlo o, o, o concretizarlo 
en, en, en habilidades muy específicas dentro de la corporación que se han desarrollado mucho, eh, como decía, las capacidades de análisis táctico, las capacidades de investigación propiamente, el poder traducir inteligencia en actos de investigación en carpetas y desde luego el tener la capacidad de intervenir eh, de forma altamente disuasiva para que no haya confrontación en las intervenciones urbanas que se tienen. Nunca se está exento, pero, pero es algo que se tiene. Y eh, creo que la, la capacidad de integrar los esfuerzos de las instituciones para actuar en esto, eh, eh, no, no escondo los sesgos, pero el, creo que ha sido muy importante que el liderazgo político abra espacios para arbitrar la relación entre las instituciones encargadas de seguridad y promover el intercambio de información y la colaboración. Eh, los equipos lo han hecho, pero ha sido muy importante tener un espacio, en este caso el gabinete de seguridad, donde esas relaciones han tenido arbitraje, han tenido conexión y se ha diseñado estrategia eh, con un liderazgo político fuerte. Esos tres elementos eh, creo que son altamente replicables en cualquier lado, además de las de, dos decisiones políticas importantes que son invertirle al tema. Eh, el, hablaba yo del aumento en los sueldos de la policía, aumentar el sueldo de la policía a 86 mil policías en 68% es una decisión de gasto que se puede tomar o no se puede tomar. Y eh, además una decisión que se ha tomado en la ciudad, por ejemplo, es de priorizar la violencia como el elemento central de la política criminal en la ciudad. Eso también es una decisión que se toma o no se toma. Entonces, estos elementos son altamente replicables. Obviamente, encontrarán obstáculos, encontrarán eh, facilidades, encontrarán eh, particularidades en cada estado, pero digamos como sustancia activa, creo que son elementos que son exportables sin duda. Bueno, gracias. Gracias, señor secretario, por su presencia hoy. Espero que podamos recibirle Uh, en Washington, uh, en forma presencial, uh, muy pronto. Pero gracias por, por su tiempo hoy. Un aplauso, por favor, por el secretario. Gracias. And now it, it's my pleasure to... Gracias. Hasta luego. To, to hand the, the program over to our moderator, Ambassador uh, Earl Anthony Wayne, who, as I mentioned before, is a uh, former ambassador to Mexico, a public policy fellow here at the Wilson Center, and also the co-chair of the advisory board of the Mexico Institute. So, Ambassador Wayne, thank you for being here, and over to you. Thank you, Andrew, very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I think we can have a very good conversation today uh, talking about preventing and combating illicit trade. There's a little bit of illicit trade to be prevented and combated, as we know, across this border. And we have uh, three excellent uh, specialists to talk with us here, who I'll introduce in just a minute. But just to put this in context, so there's $1.5 million of trade across that border every minute. So think of all the minutes you've already been here. So that's, you know, $45, $50 million worth of trade that's all already gone across. There are a million people that cross the border every day. Some of them are the same people going across and coming back, but that's a lot of people. And they, they walk, they take trucks, they take buses. Some of them, uh, you know, go on other kind of uh, vehicular traffic across there. That's a lot of people to pay attention to. And uh, not surprisingly, they can take uh, especially small, compact uh, versions of valuable goods across that border and uh, then some bigger ones in different directions. So just for the one example that I've been following most closely in recent years is fentanyl. So between fiscal year 2018 and 2023, the amount of fentanyl seized at the U.S.-Mexico border was up 1,300%. And it, it was not all front packed. If you look at the last three fiscal years, FY 21 through 23, it was up 241%. And then if you say, okay, well, Mexico and the U.S. set up a high level security dialogue, it had to get going and stuff, um, you know, but now they have good cooperation, so this should be going down. Well, it actually rose, the amount of fentanyl seized at the border was up 84% in the between the last two fiscal years. So clearly, 
a lot of people are still moving fentanyl to the border, and I'm sure they're moving a lot of other things to the border that we don't we do pay attention to, but this is so deadly that we pay close attention to it. And we're going to hear a little bit about the money flows also. It's been estimated that the sales of these drugs in the United States make between 20 and $30 billion a year. That's a lot of money. We don't find that money. We didn't find that money when I was ambassador to Mexico, and we haven't found it yet. A little bit of it crosses the border in cash, but not really that, that much. A lot of it is going through either trade-based money laundering, being invested in real estate and other things, other ways. And despite the great skills of many of our officials looking into this, we really have not yet found much of that money. Um, and it's, it's somehow getting back to the people who provide the, provided these drugs. And then, the, understandably, uh, the government of Mexico is quite concerned about the, the amount of traffic of, in arms that is going across the border. We'll hear a little bit more about that. Um, and the U.S. and Mexico have, have finally restarted trying to collect data on this. It, it started during the Obama years and then really broke down for a while, and they're now looking at it more closely. So we'll get to hear a bit more about this. But about 50% uh, percent of the arms seized were made in the United States, and another 18% were put together in the United States from parts that came from elsewhere, according to the data so far assembled by the two governments as they look at that. So, you know, that's, it's, a, it's a very serious problem, and we're go going to look at it. And we haven't, you know, we're not really talking too much today about the human smuggling, but those doing the smuggling make a lot of money, bringing those migrants up who want to get across the border, and then the cartels quite often take a cut of that when they get to the border in order to pass through their territory. They take a little cut also, which uh, is, again, illicit funding for illicit tra traffic that's going back and forth on the border. So in any case, there's a lot of, of importance that we can talk about today. I think we have with us virtually Dr. Raul Benitez Mano, who's uh, with us from the, he's a professor and researcher at the North American Research Center at UNAM in, in Mexico City. Thank you, Dr. Gracias por su presencia con nosotros. Uh, we have Kathy Lynn Austin, who is executive director of the Conflict Awareness Project and joins us from California. Welcome on this side of the, the continent. And we have Jim Vivencio, who's a senior counsel at Perkins Coy. What is that? Coey. 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 Person Coey. Okay. And he is he watches very closely the flows of money, money laundering, and other kind of flows. And and so we're looking forward to learning uh, from them all as we go forward. So we'll I'll invite everybody to make an initial presentation. And uh, then we will have a, a discussion amongst us, and then we'll take some questions. So let me, let me start off by our virtual participant, who's joining us from Mexico City, uh, doc, Dr. Benitez. If you'd like to offer some thoughts, I think you're going to talk a little bit about fentanyl flows, if I understand correctly. Eh, buenos días, eh, embajador. Muchas gracias por presentar. Agradezco mucho la invitación de Andrew Rudman, director del Mexico Institute de Woodrow Wilson Center, por la oportunidad de regresar a mi alma mater en Washington. Yo estuve en dos ocasiones como Public Policy Scholar ya hace mucho tiempo, en el 1998 y en el 2003, y me siento muy identificado con toda la trayectoria del instituto y felicidades por, por el trabajo que hacen. Eh, yo quiero continuar el sentido de la charla que el, que el embajador Wayne estaba mencionando sobre eh, México-Estados Unidos en época de campaña electoral y con el problema que identifica dos grandes temas conflictivos en la relación que es el de migración y el de las drogas y en el de las drogas principalmente el tema del de, eh, fentanilo por la parte norteamericana y una preocupación defensiva del de, eh, gobierno mexicano sobre denuncias de vínculos de, con el narcotráfico de autoridades eh, mexicanas. 
Los años de campaña, los meses de campaña, porque son años en México, la campaña empezó el año pasado, en Estados Unidos también de forma informal, eh, están llevando a una polarización temática y discursiva, como es natural en las campañas electorales en todos los países, pero esta polarización también se traduce en una polarización eh, binacional. Estados Unidos eh, tiene por, por muertes de, 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 de drogas químicas, de metanfetaminas, cristales y fentanilo, más de 100.000 muertos al año. México tiene por víctimas de la violencia producida por los carteles del narcotráfico, más de 30.000 víctimas por año. Es exactamente, demográficamente, la misma eh, cantidad de afectación cuantitativa. Eh, Estados Unidos tiene tres veces más habitantes que México, eh, entonces tiene tres veces más afectados por el consumo de fentanilo. Eh, el peligro es diferente porque uno es violencia con balas en la calle y el otro es eh, afectación al cuerpo humano de personas débiles que consumen el fentanilo, pero el efecto social es el mismo. Ahora bien, el año pasado, eh, el año 2023 fue el año del fentanilo, del fentanilo para la diplomacia bilateral. Se constituyó un comité binacional este, de, de tratamiento permanente que lleva seis eh, reuniones eh, desde que se constituyó hace un año y hay un, un, equipos burocráticos que están trabajando de forma cotidiana con el tema del fentanilo, con el tema de las armas y, y con el tema de las acusaciones de corrupción. También a este, eh, este digamos, eh, acuerdo binacional México-Estados Unidos se agrega China, que China había negado ser parte del problema hasta que China va a la reunión de Los Ángeles este, y acepta el diálogo con Estados Unidos y acepta parte de la responsabilidad. Pero para China es un asunto diplomático. China no tiene problemas de consumo de fentanilo. Eh, para China es un asunto de control de empresas que fabrican el químico. Y el argumento chino es que muchas de esas empresas son empresas de otros países, son empresas transnacionales, incluso americanas, europeas, etcétera, farmacéuticas, químicas, privadas, que producen el químico ilegalmente y lo exportan en, embaje, en envases legales. Y luego se agrega Canadá con una, con una afectación parecida a la de México y Estados Unidos, un poco menor, de consumo de fentanilo, este, 9 mil muertos, eh, este pero eh, por el tamaño de la población de Canadá, que tiene 40 millones de habitantes, es la misma proporción. Entonces tenemos un nuevo problema con el tráfico de drogas y que se está abordando eh, este, por los candidatos, pero con más fuerza en los candidatos estadounidenses a la presidencia. Bueno, tenemos otro problema que es el endurecimiento del discurso, como ya lo fue hace cuatro años, del candidato republicano probable, que es el expresidente Donald Trump, que eh, es un candidato que sus temas de campaña los hace muy estruendosamente polarizando y entonces está otra vez activando el discurso eh, culpando a la migración ilegal de todos los males de Estados Unidos, pero principalmente del sur. Pero Donald Trump tiene aliados y, y el principal aliado es el gobernador de, de Texas, este, Greg Abbott, que es más duro que el propio Trump en sus discursos y, y en sus acciones para el control de la frontera. Y aquí el tema es que la frontera tiene cuatro estados en Estados Unidos, un estado muy cooperativo con México, que es California, pero un estado muy negativo a cooperar con México, que es Texas. Entonces, esto es un problema porque también cuenta mucho la política estatal en, en Estados Unidos y Estados Unidos, como todos sabemos, es un, estado, es un país muy federalizado y eso genera tensión. Bueno, luego vienen los temas eh, mexicanos que se están introduciendo en la campaña, las acusaciones a altos eh, políticos mexicanos de corrupción y en México entonces se enciende un eh, discurso nacionalista contra Estados Unidos que en este momento y esto tiene cinco años se concentra en castigar discursivamente agencias de Estados Unidos que, inter que son interventoras en México y el malo la mala la mala agencia es la DEA eh, la DEA se cataloga como una agencia que interviene que actúa fuera de los lineamientos del presidente Biden que viola la ley mexicana y hay un movimiento este, en la opinión pública promovido por el gobierno y el gobierno tiene muchas simpatías entre la población mexicana porque es un gobierno que tiene un presidente con mucho liderazgo en el sistema de comunicación nacional, tiene más del 50% de simpatizantes el presidente, este, hab hablando de un discurso antiestadounidense y culpando a agencias como la DEA 
de ser interventoras en México y recuperan eh, periodos de la historia de México donde Estados Unidos intervino mucho. Entonces, tenemos un escenario de probable confrontación discursiva, que se calientan los ánimos en los candidatos a las presidencias. En el caso mexicano, las candidatas a la presidencia han sido muy moderadas en retomar este discurso conflictivo. En el caso de Estados Unidos, el, el presidente Biden en su campaña por la reelección también ha sido muy moderado, es un presidente moderador de conflictos, pero el candidato Trump es un candidato que su, su forma de trabajar para ganar adeptos es la confrontación y esto puede, puede proveer una, un conflicto discursivo muy fuerte entre los dos gobiernos este año. Ahora, migración es un tema de seguridad nacional en Estados Unidos desde la época del presidente George W. Bush. Eh, siempre lo ha sido en el siglo XXI, pero esperemos que no afecte mucho la relación ni en el periodo de campaña, porque sabemos que la migración se ha incrementado muchísimo, pero muchos de estos migrantes ya no son mexicanos, Muchos de estos migrantes provienen ya de todo el mundo, provienen de China, provienen de Nigeria, provienen de Brasil, en muchos países sudamericanos. Hay una migración incrementándose muchísimo en México que quiere cruzar Estados Unidos, pero que se queda en México de cubanos, de haitianos, de venezolanos e incluso de procedentes de África y Asia, que se vuelve un, un tema muy conflictivo en, en las campañas electorales. Sin embargo, ahí con esto concluyo porque me pidieron que hablara cinco minutos para abrir el debate eh, hay partes positivas en, en la relación bilateral que se potenciarán por algunos de los candidatos eh, yo creo que por ejemplo el candidato Biden es un candidato constructivo y las dos candidatas a la presidencia de México son candidatas que eh, tienen un discurso positivista en la relación con Estados Unidos y no rupturista o conflictivista en la relación pero el candidato Trump es un can candidato pues con su naturaleza personal eh, conflictivo y probablemente se repita el discurso de hace cuatro años. Eh, con esto termino con lo triste que es decir que la relación México-Estados Unidos se reduce a migración y fentanilo. La, la, la relación es mucho más compleja que eso, ¿no? pero ese es el discurso público. Eh, muchas gracias, embajador Wayne, por, sus, por su moderación. Gracias, doctor. I, and I think we're all agreed that this could become a very hot topic in the campaign as com coming up. We know that a number of Republicans have already called for using military force to go into Mexico after cartel leaders. So we'll see how this develops, but which makes it all the more important that the governments work together to reduce the flow of these drugs as we go forward. But let's let's talk a little bit about the flow of arms, and then we'll talk about the flow of money, which makes both flows possible after that. So please, Kathy. Thank you. Um, first, I do want to give a shout out to the Wilson Center for convening this um, security conference. I think it's very important and vital. Um, they also co-hosted a panel at the North Capitol Forum in Mexico City last October, and that was a closed um, session, but sort of the, um, the main themes that arose from that was the need for continued cooperation and building of trust, because even with the bicentennial framework, there's a long way to go um, with developing that, and I think this conference is a clear pathway to developing that coordination and trust um, amongst players. I also wanted to mention something that hit really close to home. I, I just felt I had to. Um, but uh, two weeks ago, a colleague of mine lost his wife in Tulum, um, who was vacationing there. Uh, she was caught between um, the crossfire of two narco traffickers. And for me, that just really brings home. We had traveled together to the San Diego Tijuana border a year before working on some of our research for the report I'll mention here. And at that time, one of the things that became clear as we interviewed, for example, um, Border Patrol was that the Border Patrol was allowed to, and this is on the San Diego Tijuana border, really look at illicit drugs and counterfeit money, but they were lacking intelligence and information that would help them with um, targeting illicit arms going across the border. So I just had to give a shout out to my colleague for his good work in that area and the loss of his life. Um, 
And then I wanted to mention that um, I have produced, uh, co-authored a report um, w under the auspices of the Pacific Council um, for International Policy out in Los Angeles. And just to correct the ambassador, I have moved back <laughs> to the oh. East Coast. So I'm now living uh, not far from Richmond, Virginia. Um, so it's kind of nice to be back home and also to have more access to the Hill and to others that are really working um, tirelessly on this issue of trying to reduce illicit trade in U.S. guns to Mexico. Welcome back. Thank you. It's really nice to be back. Um, in the report that I co-authored, um, which is called the U.S.-Mexico Double Fix, because there's clearly both countries have to do a lot um, in order to meet the challenge, um, I think we often think of U.S. guns going to Mexico and the impact, but there's clearly other areas that are of concern um, in the security realm, and that is the diversion of weapons in Mexico from security forces and also the involvement of security forces using a lot of the guns that are exported from the U.S. So there are two sides, right, to this problem, and it's not just the um, impact of U.S. guns to Mexico, although that is uh, one of the predominant um, concerns. Um, so in this report that I co-authored, there's 30 recommendations for all state Olders, including governments, all the way to the gun industry and civil society. Um, so I'll only be able to give a like, few highlights here in the sort of few minutes that I have. Um, but I think what has already been done well is the framing of the issue, um, the stakes that are clearly involved here. And those stakes, as we know, include not only drug trafficking abuses, but also over, um, overdose deaths in the United States. There's also the undermining of legitimate government authority in Mexico, and that is clearly what this firepower from the U.S. is. Um, it's creating that permissive environment for that. Um, there is the facilitation of the historic levels of violence, which we've all talked about, not just the homicides, but the disappeared. And then anyone who woke up to news reports today know that two mayoral candidates were killed in Mexico today um, by firearms. Um, there are five of the most dangerous cities in the world in Mexico, and again, this is predominantly from armed violence. Um, the stakes in terms of what is impacting the U.S. is that um, about 70 percent, um, it's very hard to quantify the flow of illicit weapons across the U.S. border. Um, I'm not one who likes to quantify, but we can refer to official reports that, that do exist. And there's upwards from 70 to 80 percent of the firearms recovered from crime scenes um, in Mexico that are of U.S. origin. Um, again, we only have the data that the Mexico that Mexico government is providing for tracing to the U.S. So we, there may be um, crime scenes where the Mexico government is not reporting, um, for example, certain data. Uh, let's say if a security force is using a legally imported weapon. So there's still a little bit of lack of transparency and accountability around that issue, and it's critical to, to, to talk about that as well. But the vast majority of guns found at um, crime scenes in Mexico come from the U.S. Um, additionally, again, with the data that we have from e-tracing or tracing from the U.S. Uh, in cooperation with U.S. authorities, um, we know that there are anywhere from 2,000 to 700, 200,000 to 700,000 guns crossing um, each year. That, that means that it, you know, sort of the low end is 500 a day, the high end is 2,000 a day. But clearly, again, we can't really quantify. There's so much that um, is not in our view because of the lack of forensics or the fact that they're smuggled and not seized. Um, but the, the figures are tremendously high, right, um, particularly coming from one source. So I've looked at arms trafficking all around the globe, and I'm astounded by the, the rate of U.S. illicit flows um, to Mexico. Now, since we're talking about illicit trade, I just wanted to um, give you a kind of throw out there for discussion. 
um, what makes this propensity of this illicit trade feasible? And first, you know, there needs to be an, a great understanding that there's a great number of U.S. manufacturers in the U.S. And that makes it very difficult for um, regulatory control. Um, it's the sheer number of um, gun stores in the U.S. So there's more gun stores in the U.S. than Starbucks, Starbucks McDonald's, and Subway combined. Hmm. That's a huge number if you think of what law enforcement needs to do in order to stay on top of um, illicit activity. Um, there's also a vast number of stolen guns in the U.S., so we have a very high percentage. Um, that's why there's a lot of efforts to get more safe storage of firearms, and then a lot of uh, some of the um, crime guns are coming from guns that have been stolen. There's also a large number of uh, straw buyers, so that is when someone purchases a gun on behalf of another person um, in order for that gun or those guns to be trafficked across the border. Um, there is the lack of regulation at gun shows, private sales, and online. Again, that makes it difficult um, for law enforcement when they're trying to devise strategies to interdict or seize. The vast majority of guns in Mexico come from four states. Um, that is Arizona, Texas, New Mexico, and California. And so there, the U.S. government has been concentrating its efforts on um, investigations and targeting illicit firearms trafficking in these areas. But again, it's astounding that most of the crime guns come from this area. There are also European arms companies and other um, international companies that have come to the U.S., open subsidiaries, in order to export um, to Mexico or whose guns are also found as crime guns in Mexico. And the reason for their coming to the U.S. is because there's less regulation here. Um, and so they have found, they have been um, exploiting um, this loophole. And then there's a sense, at least amongst the Mexicans, um, which we'll talk about a little bit in terms of the lawsuit they filed against gun manufacturers in the U.S., that there is a purposeful marketing and potentially distribution to organized crime networks. And lastly, the gun lobby in the U.S., I think, creates a self-interested narrative that more guns are needed to create more security. And I'll talk in a minute about how that has not worked for Mexico in the past. Um, the good news is that um, there have been developments um, with the Bicentennial Framework. So it's still in its infancy and we can expect, right, that there might still be a lot of room for improvement. Um, but one little note for me, or one thing that I find really relevant here is that before the Bicentennial Framework um, became the Working Cooperation Security Agreement between U.S. and Mexico, Mexico had filed a lawsuit um, against gun manufacturers in the U.S. So that was in August, and then the Bicentennial Framework really took off in October of 2021. Why that's relevant is because when the Bicent Bicentennial Framework came out with its um, action plan for the first time combating guns trafficking was a central plank. That's very important because it commits both sides to tackling this very important issue. Um, now, I would say that based on my interviews with a lot of Mexican officials, there has been concern that the U.S. has not done enough to follow through on this plank. Um, that at high-level meetings they are talking more specifically about drug trafficking and migration, which are critical issues, obviously, to the U.S., and less about guns, even though the Mexican officials continue to really provide a lot of very strong forensic data pointing to the problem. So, again, there is a lot of room for attention to this matter, but at least it's a plank in the bicentennial framework, a top priority, and so Mexico can use that as an opportunity to push the U.S. for um, greater control. Um, the, I think Mexico officials 
for a large part, have been concerned that the U.S. is not looking at arms trafficking or the, the illicit trade in guns. They're looking at it mostly through a lens of arms trafficking and not looking at it through a lens of a supply chain problem. And what that means is they're looking at smugglers on the border that they can catch, but less often they're looking at upstream. And the concern has been, for example, when there's political will, or I would say when there is political will, um, the U.S., for example, has been pushing Mexico um, to go after and has even created a larger, like, um, international approach to looking at the precursor chemicals that are being used to produce fentanyl. So that is where the U.S. has taken the lead on going after supply chains. But the fe feeling and the sentiment, um, what I find in Mexico, is that the U.S. is not doing enough of the same to go after its own original sources of the weapons, and that they're very similar to what we've experienced with the opioid um, problem, that often the gun manufacturers and dealers and suppliers know when their weapons are going downstream um, to illicit actors. Um, they're often given this information from ATF when ATF is tracing weapons on behalf of Mexico. So there's clearly knowledge base there amongst the gun industry. But the gun industry, again, is protected in a way that the pharmaceutical companies were not um, because of legislation in the United States which shields the gun companies um, from liability. Um, that again is why Mexico has advanced a case in the U.S. Um, just last month we had a ruling um, in um, the case of U.S. Uh, of Mexico versus Smith & Wesson um, against the gun manufacturers, an appeals court allowed for it to, to move forward. So those are some of the, I think, high-level issues. Um, there are still key issues that continue to be raised. They are the need for more extensive tracing, um, the need for the U.S. to clamp down on assault rifles, rifles and particularly five, 50 caliber rifles, which are found more and more Often, there's a lack of uh, federal firearm licensees inspections in the U.S., which is also a problem that um, should be surmounted if there, this problem is going to be addressed. There's a need for more targeted border inspections. Currently, there are only targeted inspections at um, key ports of entry, but not all. Um, there's a need under the bicentennial framework for metrics. Um, neither side is really working with metrics to demonstrate how they can show that they're making progress on this issue. And one of the key things that I found um, on both sides of the border is that there's a lack of understanding of what the jurisdictions and the functionality is of all the various different agencies that are addressing the illicit um, trade and that some form of mapping would be useful. Thank you very much. Okay, Jim, tell us a little bit about all this money that's flowing around invisibly. <laughs> sure, uh, can, can everybody hear me okay? Great, um, so uh, my name is Jim Vivenzio and I uh, spent uh, 32 years uh, with the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, and I was their uh, director for BSA AML Policy. Uh, essentially, I spent my entire career, uh, all 32 years uh, when I was in government, in the uh, fraud and AML space. So I've really seen how this area has just continually evolved, especially with technology, uh, you know, and now we're getting away from cash into virtual currencies, and um, it's, it's really been a, a, a fascinating process to, to see. Um, and uh, with regard to anti-money laundering, the one thing that I've also seen is it's like the flow of water. It, it goes to the point of least resistance, you know, where the, those financial institutions that have the weakest controls are the ones that are impacted. Um, I came to Washington in 2000, right before 9-11, uh, 
and uh, saw the, uh, the growth and expansion of the anti-money laundering laws uh, in, into the terrorist area, terror, anti-terrorism area, um, and was involved in drafting those regulations. My perspective on Mexico as a bank regulator is, um, you know, there is a, a lot of cooperation going on between the, 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 the federal banking agencies and, and the Mexican uh, uh, banking agencies, and, and, and that's, that went on throughout my entire career, and it was very impressive, um, the level of, of communication and cooperation. Um, but uh, throughout my, my regulatory career at the OCC, um, you know, there were very impactful events that occurred concerning, you know, you know Mexico and the money laundering typologies. Uh, between 2008 and 2012, uh, there were enormous enforcement cases that were brought against some of the biggest money center banks, um, you know, involving uh, accounts uh, with uh, some of the Mexican financial institutions. And the penalties, uh, you know, involved in those cases were unprecedented. It went into the billions of dollars. Um, as a result, uh, Mexico saw the writing on the wall with regard to the, you know, some of the unintended consequences of these enforcement cases is what's known as de-risking, you know, where, where financial institutions lose their U.S. correspondent relationships. Um, and so, you know, after all those big cases took place, you know, Mexico took the courageous step of amending their laws to actually restrict U.S. currencies. Um, to, to certain dollar values, and, uh, and I think that went a long way uh, in ensuring that uh, you know, U.S. financial institutions didn't de-risk Mexico, as was happening with many other geographic areas. Um, after, uh, you know, after the de-risking issue, then we had uh, actually de-risking taking place in the United States, where um, you know, there was de-risking along the southwest border, where farmers, you know, that, that basically, you know, had, you know, were selling goods in Mexico were losing their bank accounts and banking relationships, and it had a huge impact. And uh, in, in uh, I believe it was 2018, the GAO released a study trying to figure out what was going on on the southwest border. So, so these are some of the unintended consequences you get with these AML laws, is you get, you know, de-risking of entire countries, you get de-risking of regions in the United States where, where, where you know, you know, U.S. companies and citizens, you know, can't maintain banking uh, relationships. And then the third major issue uh, with the AML laws that we also see is a humanitarian crisis, uh, you know, where because of, you know, certain, um, you know, sanctions requirements in, in certain geographies, um, it, it, it's difficult, if not impossible, to get humanitarian aid into those regions that, that, need, uh, that need the assistance. So uh, it, it's the, you know, just wanted to point that out. On the money laundering front, um, uh, Treasury two weeks ago uh, just issued its 2024 uh, National Money Laundering Risk Assessment. It's a, uh, I'd, I'd encourage everybody interested in this space, take a look at that. It kind of lays out all the threats and vulnerabilities. What I found interesting about this risk assessment is you know, you know, throughout my career, um, you know, the money laundering typologies always seem to emphasize, uh, you know, south of the border. Um, interestingly, and I, I just did a quick, uh, you know, dirty analysis of these risk assessments, and they come out every two years. The first one came out in 2015. And uh, since 2015, there were 85 references to Mexico in the risk assessment, three references to China, nine references to Russia. This current risk assessment has um, essentially uh, 35 references to Mexico, so down nearly 60%, 62 references to China, up nearly 2,000%, and 88 references to Russia, uh, up nearly 900%. Uh, so, you know, and that's in a nine-year time period, you know, and, and, and I, f I found that interesting because it clearly shows you know, a, a change in focus uh, of, of uh, you know, the Treasury Department that issues this uh, financial crimes enforcement network, um, you know, to, to focus more on a, on a more global perspective to, to money laundering, because that's really what's happening right now. Um, you know, China is involved in, in the fentanyl trade. Uh, this report indicates that the chemicals and the manufacturing uh, uh, you know, tools are being shipped from China 
to Mexico and, and the fentanyl is being produced in, in, in Mexico and then coming across the borders. Um, the report also indicates that there's also terrorism. Uh, there have been, uh, you know, attempts by known terrorists to also cross the border through these, this human smuggling that's, that's taking place by these criminal uh, or organizations. Um, so, uh, so I, I, you know, I, I wanted to point that out. Um, the, 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 the risk assessment also gets into, you know, the main threats, and the threats it gets into are, the, are, are frauds, corruption, drug trafficking, cybercrime, the money laundering networks professionally, uh, human trafficking and smuggling, ta tax crimes, and wildlife and nature crimes. Second section gets into the vulnerabilities and the risks, including cash, financial products, legal entities, virtual entities, uh, compliance deficiencies, luxury and high-value goods, casinos, gaming, and, and entities not covered by AML, AML requirements, including investment advisors, payment processors, attorneys, and accountants. Interestingly, uh, this risk assessment has five pages just devoted to attorneys, and I thought that was, that was, that was interesting. The previous one from 2022, 20, uh, 20, uh, essentially devoted one paragraph to attorneys. So uh, it looks like there's going to be some regulation forthcoming, but I, I just want to end uh, by pointing out a lot is happening right now in my area in the AML space. Um, there's a new law called the Corporate Transparency Act that just went into effect on January 1st and it requires non-exempt legal entities to report their beneficial ownership to FinCEN. Um, it's, a, it's a huge undertaking. If any of you in the room own a, a, a limited liability company, you've got to file these reports by, uh, by January 1st of next year. Uh, there's also going to be, uh, a, you know, FinCEN just proposed uh, this past month, I should say within the past two weeks, proposed rules to regulate investment advisors to, 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 you know, essentially address the money laundering risks taking place through, you know, you know, you know basically private equity. Um, there's also been a proposed rule the past month, past few weeks, uh, in real estate transactions uh, that involve cash that are, that's going to require the settlement agents to understand, you know, who, you know, you know and, 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 and report, you know, who, who are the beneficial owners behind these real estate transactions. Um, yeah, you know, there's FinCEN also proposed a rule in the antiques and and, and antiquities area. You know, you know the, the final rule hasn't come out yet, but um, you know there's so much happening in this space. Um, you know, to to close the gaps and and prevent uh, you know these uh, you know these money launderers uh, and identify them. Uh, you know, when the laundering takes place. Um, and this evolution is continuing. Uh, you know, the, 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 the risk assessment gets into, you know, some of the traditional money laundering methods, including, you know, funnel accounts uh, from multiple banks in the U.S. to a single bank account in the border. It also gets into the traditional methods of bulk cash smuggling, you know, taking the cash over the border, which was essentially what those, you know, 20, 2008 to 2012 cases involved. Uh, ultimately, what happened is, again, it, it, it evolves. In, in 2010, you know, when we put those cases together, you know, we, we saw everything was happening in a bank. You know, we were able to see the entire typology right before us and, 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 and develop that, that money laundering typology of bulk cash repatriation smuggling. Now, uh, you know, there, there were three components to it. You had the wire, you had the, uh, you know, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the cash uh, services going to the Federal Reserve, and you had the, the check clearing and the check processing. So, so, you know, now what's happened is all of those activities have now moved outside the bank. You know, you now have these third-party processors that are doing all of the check processing on behalf of banks. You now actually have these, these cash, uh, you know, vaults, third-party cash vaults that are vaulting cash on behalf of banks. So it's all moving away from banks, and it's making it more difficult for banks to really see, you know, what's going on out there and put these typologies together. So it's just a continuing, continue, uh, you know, evolution, um, and uh, you know, it's 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 really up to uh, you know the regulators and the officials to stay on top of this, and uh, and and it's 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 a very challenging task. So. Yeah, thank you very much, Jim. Very sadly, those threats were all quite evident when I was ambassador in Mexico, and we could. It's taken a long time to get people to to act on these things. I'm glad they are. And they're shifting their attention. And just recently, there was a, a report by Reuters saying about 7.5 percent of remittances are probably also tied to cartels, and that was 65 million, 65 billion dollars last year in remittances. 
So there's a lot of money flowing around there, and we have not been able to find it for all the reasons that you mentioned. These are smart people, and they hire smart people to figure out how to send their money back. Yeah, and, and the remittances are low, low, low dollar values. Yeah, so it, it's, it's, right. it's very hard to detect. And you know, one of the things that, that, that I've been pushing it, you know, throughout my career just has been through the use of technology. You know, you know, you know, you know, you know the, the, these new AI systems and things like that, you know, can really make a difference in, uh, you know, in the sophistication of the ability of financial institutions to identify these kind of threats. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I mean, part of the problem was all of our institutions were just overwhelmed by the suspicious reports, uh, you know, money reports they had to use to find, and we couldn't even sort through those reports from banks and things. Yeah. So yeah. you're exactly right. I think that's a place where AI can help. Well, let's talk for a few minutes about each of these. Let me start off asking, and uh, Dr. Orr, maybe you would like to comment on this first. Um, what do you think are a couple of steps that could actually help slow I won't say eliminate the flow of fentanyl. And what do you think are a couple of steps that could overcome this mistrust, which you referred to, which has been evident during this whole administration in Mexico, mistrust of U.S. agencies, which makes it very, very hard to have serious investigations that are cross-border investigations. What, what do you think could help open this up? And then I'll invite comments from both of you too, please. So, eh, ambasador, eh, I think, eh, en español, yo creo que los políticos de Estados Unidos y de México deben de dejar, dar un paso adelante y olvidarse de las acusaciones y trabajar en conjunto. Porque todos los países, todos los gobiernos están, eh, tienen eh, puntos fallidos. Son estados fallidos en el control de las aduanas. En el, en el control de las armas en el caso mexicano y la venta de armas en el caso de Estados Unidos. Eh, China no está controlando las fábricas y las exportaciones. México no controla la aduana de entrada, la fábrica de fentanilo, la, el movimiento del fentanilo y el, el, el paso por la frontera. Estados Unidos no controla la entrada, Canadá no controla la entrada. Entonces debe haber cooperación y dejar de hacer acusaciones porque todos están fallando en sus responsabilidades, todos los gobiernos están fallando en sus responsabilidades. Y el problema del fentanilo es que es mucho más fácil transportarlo que la cocaína o que la marihuana o que cualquier otra droga, porque las pastillas son muy chiquitas y las puede cargar cualquiera. Y, y en las fronteras, muchos este, estadounidenses y mexicanos llevan pequeñas bolsas de, de, de fentanilo en, en la bolsa de su ropa y no es detectada por, por este por las aduanas. Los perros eh, que huelen drogas en las aduanas no están funcionando porque las pastillas se empacan con el, el empaque de, de aluminio de las medicinas. Mm. Entonces, en vez de estar acusándose unos a otros, Estados Unidos a China, a México, México a Estados Unidos, eh, etcétera, de, debe de, de implementarse este control y las agencias de los gobiernos tienen que tener más cuidado en la divulgación de acusaciones. Eso es lo que yo creo, embajador. Okay, gracias. It, either of you like to make some comments on, on that question? Two or three steps that could help deal with fentanyl flows and could rebuild cooperation trust, let's say, that we have, we have a little bit rebuilt, but not as much as we need to do. Just something to point out um, with the illicit uh, trade in guns and drugs, I find that there is, um, in both countries, there has been a predominant um, tackling of this issue from a law enforcement perspective. And so one of the ways that I think could um, sort of move both sides further is to look at it more from a national security perspective, more of an intelligence gathering, um, more of a, sort of, the U.S. likes to use the word whole of government approach, um, but I do find kind of in both of these areas that it has been largely um, predominantly um, law enforcement rather than at a higher critical level where I think um, things could become more useful. Um, and then the other issue is just really resources. Um, I think the U.S. sometimes has felt that it's provided a lot of resources to Mexico in the past, and that has led to some 
um, sort of misplaced with the kingpin strategy, with the militarization of public security, and when it came to guns, the kind of sting operations and gun walking, fast and furious, for example, that didn't work. Um, and so the emphasis now is can we build more also at a subnational level, at a granular level, but at the same time, high level intelligence um, sharing and coordination. Yeah, you know, you know, one area that has been very effective in the anti-money laundering space is the de development of, of an international group known as the FATF, or the Financial Action Task Force. And the FATF actually evaluates every country every 10 years and gives them a rating as to the strength of their controls, AML controls. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and it's been very effective because those countries that are designated by FATF as having weak controls you know, really have problems, you know, economically and globally in, 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 in getting, uh, in, you know, their, their you know, correspondent banking relationships and things like that. In fact, you know, some countries, when they're designated, you know, U.S. banks can't provide them with services. And, it, and, it's, and it's been very, very effective. And I, I you know, I, I think that that type of global coordination here is necessary because, like, you know, as I pointed out earlier, this isn't just a, a, a Mexico problem. This is a global problem. Uh, you know the, these supplies, you know, are are, are coming, you know, from uh, you know from other areas, and 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 this has to be addressed and tackled on a more global basis, from my perspective. Similar similar to the to the, to the use of you know an entity like the, the the FATF that does in fact go out there and 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 examine countries. In fact, the U.S. is being examined again next year. The FATF examiners are coming in and they're looking at you know all U.S. industries and how effective the controls that, that the U.S. has in place. And when we get dinged by the FATF, that's what results in change. And that's that's the reason why we, we've got these these new investment advisor rules. You know, the FATF has identified that as a deficiency in our in our program. The real estate rules, the FATF identified that, and and it it proved to be a, a very effective mechanism. I agree. It has. I used to work on that, and yes, I agree fully that it does. The problem is when some countries are less enthusiastic about actually applying the recommendations that, that are made. Um, shifting a little bit to, uh, to what you were saying, Kathy, about the lack of mat metrics and action plans, which is true not only for arms, mm -hmm. but it's true in the entire high-level security dialogue process, very sadly. They only, they agreed on objectives. They never agreed on actual specific action plans or metrics for doing this. But let me ask a, a more basic question. You talked a lot about what the U.S. isn't doing. So why doesn't Mexico actually check cars coming into the United States? There's no checks on the Mexican side of the border to try and find these arms. Why is that? And that has gone on. I raised it when I was ambassador, mm -hmm. so over 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the Mexicans have not, have, it, they're very serious about complaining to us, mm -hmm. but they're not willing to put people on the board, their side of the border to actually check. Why is that? Very good question. And that question is often raised at the technical level on the border. Um, so when I have been interviewing Border Patrol, um, that they feel sometimes the onus is on them and why can't Mexico do more because it is, after all, the guns impacting Mexico. But clearly the number one answer to that question is a resource issue. The U.S. has far more resources to apply than the Mexican government does. Um, there is also the concern around corruption and the co-opting of security forces on the border. So Internally in Mexico, um, there's concern about what security forces will be effective in um, actually monitoring the border. Um, so I think those are kind of the, the critical issues, the resource issue, the U.S. has far more. Um, but again, it is we weapons that are coming from the U.S. that you know, the U.S. has a responsibility in terms of getting better control over its supply chain. And then on the Mexico side, um, I think there is some granular level cooperation on the borders, but really there is um, a lack of um, attentiveness. And then also with the migration issue being so overwhelming um, and that a lot of the security apparatus being used to address the migration issue 
um, which the U.S. has um, basically asked Mexico to take on that issue for a large part um, is a reason why Mexico hasn't really extended a lot of these resources um, at the border. Well, I just have to add, yeah. I think you might know, we offered actually to pay for scanners on their side of the border, and they refused to accept it. That's because right. Because of There's that mistrust a that the doctor mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. I mean, from the current government in Mexico. Absolutely. And then there is a lot of technological improvements that could be there. It's the lack of trust, as we mentioned, the lack of cooperation in this area. But there are also other global actors involved. So China wanting to put oh. scanners at oh. the border or provide technological improvements. So I think there's a lot more than just Mexico refusal, but also Mexico having other actors and stakeholders that um, the U.S. needs to be concerned about as well. Okay. They actually turned down the China. They did yeah, not buy the did. Chinese exactly. scanners at the border, so they might have some imports already. Um, okay. So what, what would you like to see as the, the, the focus for, for really getting a better handle on all this money that's flowing around. I mean, there are a bunch of different initiatives going on that are very important. Are there two or three that you think would be the mo might be the most effective in trying to find some of this money that's swashing around, or you think it's going to ha just have to be developing these five to ten initiatives that, every that the U.S. is now working on more seriously? Yeah, you know, you know, sadly, in the financial area, you know, we're also impacted by funding. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the Congress passed, you know, the AML Act of 2020, uh, you know, went effective on January 1st of 2021, and we're now in, you know, 2024, and, you know, just getting some of these proposed rules issued now. I mean, it, it's, it's taken three years. Um, you know, it, it's going to take, you know, how much more time to get these final rules issued? Um, and, you know, and, and so that's, that's been a big problem, has been, you know, funding of uh, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network um, so that they can essentially get these rules out quicker. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, there, there's a lot going on. There are going to be a lot more f proposed rules coming out. Um, you know, under the uh, AML Act of 2020, um, that are that are that are important for this entire framework, um, and yet, uh, you know, it's it's already been you know three years since uh, enactment, um, and you know we're still waiting for the final you know for these final rules to come out. So, it's a funding issue. Um, I, you know, I, you know, assuming all of the rules that that are contemplated. In the AML, AML Act of 2020, you know, ultimately come out and it's it's working as it should. Um, I, I think it'll it'll go a long way in uh, you know addressing you know many of these you know financial areas and vulnerabilities and things like that. Um, you know, the 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 new challenge that's coming up is is in the you know decentralized finance and virtual currency space. Um, and the AML Act also addresses those areas, and FinCEN's, you know, also coming out with new rules. Uh, they, they just issued a proposal uh, with regard to uh, tumblers and mixers um, that would require uh, an entire new reporting regime on the part of, you know, virtual asset service providers that will re require them to report any transactions in the virtual currency space that touch a mixer. Um, and they just came out with that rule proposal in, in October. Uh, and, and, and a mixer is essentially a, a mechan uh, it's a, 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 con a, a, I should say, a smart contract or a, a, a method of uh, obscuring the source of virtual currency. You know, so somebody can basically, you know, s you know submit their virtual currency into a mixer. And, um, you know, the, that, that individual who, who, who put it into the mixer, uh, you know, is then completely anonymized with regard to where that virtual currency goes. So it basically, you know, takes, takes a chunk of virtual currency and then dis disperses it, um, you know, in multiple ways to obscure the, the ultimate, you know, uh, so, you know w where those funds are going, you know, m makes it uh, very difficult for law enforcement to trace, uh, you know, that virtual currency. So, um, so yeah, so it, 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 I was heartened uh, to see 
you know, FinCEN, you know, getting into, into these types of areas because ultimately, you know, ransomware is, is a huge problem. I don't know if you all recall, you know, about a year and a half ago, you know, the, the entire, you know, northeast region of the United States, or, uh, you know, pump, you know their, their, their oil was disrupted through a, through a ransomware attack. Right. And, uh, and, you know, essentially what FinCEN's been finding is those ransomware attacks are directly tied to these mixers, and, and the mixers are just making it very difficult for law enforcement to trace the virtual currencies that are required uh, in these ransomware attacks. So, uh, so you know, this is going to be the new challenge, is going to be in this, you know, virtual currency decentralized finance space. And, uh, and, and, and you know, the, uh, you know the, the fraudsters are right on top of these areas. You know, they have expertise, and, and they're going to, uh, you know, use it to the best of their ability. Right. No, that's very that's very interesting. They're finding new ways to move things around. Yeah, yeah. And one thing we haven't mentioned yet tonight, but I mean today, but just to mention is the use of sanctions that the Biden administration has started over the last year and a half of more vigorous use of sanctions in fentanyl supply chains. They just issued a set of sanctions on human smuggling and transportation, including bus companies and other companies, um, which is another tool that they have, but it takes work. Also, OFAC has to get the div, do all the homework to develop sanctions, and then you have to apply the sanctions. So yeah. it all takes a lot of work and takes people power to get it to get it done. Are there any questions from the audience, um, either the virtual audience or the in-person audience, Embajadora? Uh, it, it, is it is it feasible? You know, y yes, it's feasible. Um, but the big problem is the privacy component. Um, you know, for there to be a, a national virtual currency, um, uh, you know, there's there's you know the, there's the fear that you know the government is going to be able to see every one of your transactions. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the challenges that there are these, you know, the, currently there are these groups that are, that are looking into trying to figure out if, if it's possible to have a, 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 you know, a national virtual currency. Um, and, uh, you, know, you know, whether or not there could be some sort of an encryption, you know, that would essentially block the, the ability uh, to see through uh, the transactions on, on the part of the government. And, and apparently they've got the technology to do that, but the encryption um, slows down the transaction too much. So the technology isn't there yet that would uh, enable a national virtual currency to be, uh, you know, private. And that's, I think, w I think that's where this is going, and that's what folks are working towards is trying to to figure out a way to to encrypt virtual currencies. And 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 then there's also the example of of, of China. You know where where China does have uh, like a national type virtual currency, um, you know, but uh, but but folks are are concerned about how that's being used uh, to um, you know to in but, terms. But, of but the what's wrong with the government looking at all your transactions? What's wrong with that? That's the only way to find out who is doing illegal things. Yeah, well, that's that's that. You know, there's there's been a history of privacy in this country. Um, you know, in 1970, I believe, almost 50 years ago. Uh, almost half a century ago, um, there was a law passed. Uh, it was called the Right to Financial Privacy Act, um, and the Right to Financial Privacy Act has been, uh, you know, a part of of this this country's fabric, uh, you know, for for almost half a century now. Um, and people expect a, a level of privacy with respect to their financial transactions. Um, and so I think that's 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 the issue. It's 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 uh, you know it's it's kind of I think it's embedded in in our ethos and in our culture here in the U.S. I mean it's a, it's been been around for a half a century. As strong as the right to carry arms. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to add that one of the reasons that the financial intelligence unit, the WEF in Mexico, is less efficient is because of exactly the same concern. They could not get the law changed to allow the government to see everybody's private financial assets because individuals who were elected, i.e. members of Congress, 
did not trust the government to have access to all of that information. And as you remember, there have been a number of instances where it might have looked like the WEF was doing things for political ends and targeting certain people. And um, I think that just reinforced the fear among a number of Mexicans that they weren't sure that they could trust their government either at this point. Hopefully we can get to a trustworthy point, but I don't think we're quite there yet in either country, I just add. Other questions, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Pablo Ampudia. Thank you very much for, for this panel. It's super interesting. And well, the first question I have is for you, Ms. Austin. And well, despite the existence of several uh, frameworks, the Merida Initiative, the Bicentennial Framework, we continue to observe heightened levels of violence, drug consumption, uh, overdose, etc. And well, in light of this, this fact, do you see the need of transitioning to a new framework, creative, more creative framework that truly integrates and harmonizes laws, policies, institutions between Mexico and the US? And secondly, what do you see as the biggest challenge to overcome the distrust between both governments, particularly in the context of the 2024 elections? And secondly, if I may, for Mr. Vicencio, uh, well, given uh, that cartels continue to transition to, uh, well, to diversify their sources of revenue and now move to licit economies, trading of uh, avocados, lemons, etc. Are there any mechanisms to trace and tackle, well, that money and, well, impede that it ends up in the cartels' uh, pockets? Thank you very much. There's some easy questions. Yeah. <laughs> well, the bicentennial framework is only a couple years old. Um, and so if we push forward um, some of the things we're talking about here, about mapping, about creating metrics, about creating action plan, I think it's very difficult to go back to the beginning now. And from my perspective, we do have combating arms trafficking as a first major plank in the security framework. So from as a, you know, a person looking at seriously at those issues and how we can address them, I think it's really relevant. I will say that there is also the problem, right, of changes of administration. Um, so both countries are going to be going through changes of administration, and we don't quite know what that's going to argue. But there has been a number of huge developments, and one of the things is the um, Bipartisan uh, Safety Community Act, right, in, in the U.S., which for the first time created a, uh, made a straw purchasing and arms trafficking a federal crime. And already the number of traffickers and the number of prosecutions going forward um, since that, that's only about a year old has already um, escalated quite a bit. So you can see that there is now legislation moving in that direction. Um, there is also elevated resources, but with the, you know, with changes in administration, right, um, we, or possible changes in administrations coming up in the election year, we don't quite know, right, where this might go forward. The problem in the U.S. obviously is the political, cultural, and constitutional issues around gun ownership and, 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 and the protection of the gun industry. And I think that's really where civil society, um, legislation, and a tough administration really has to act in the future in, on the U.S. side. On the Mexico side, I think the ambassador was alluding to the fact that, yes, transnational organized um, crime networks control a lot of the border areas. And that is something that Mexico is going to have to get um, a handle on. Um, they're going to have to do more on the prosecutorial level. They're going to have to um, build greater capacity in their own judiciary institutions and better relationships between security forces, judiciary, and other institutions within Mexico. Um, so there's lots of room for improvement within the framework itself, but I would say on the arms issue, that what we have now is that it's a uh, combating illicit arms is a key plank. So 
Jim, Doctor, would you each like to maybe add a couple thoughts as we yeah, wrap up? Sure. Just to just to you know address the question you had raised, um, you know, with with regard to legitimate businesses, um, you know, generally when a bank has a, a, a you know a legitimate business account, it it can identify that that business is legitimate. You know, e either either based on outliers and volumes, the bank should also be able to see. You know, the, ex the legitimate expenses coming in for that particular business. Um, so one of the things that we would sometimes see would be a business opening up, uh, you know, only a receipts account at a bank, and then their expense account would be somewhere else. And so the banker really didn't get a comprehensive view of that relationship. And, 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 and that's not good from an AML perspective. Is, is, you know, if a customer's coming to you and they're only going to give you part of their business and the other part's over here, you're not able to put it all together, that, that creates risks to the bank, to the financial institution. The other thing we also saw was we saw legitimate businesses that were essentially hijacked by the, the fraudsters um, through threats that if you don't launder our money, um, you know, there's going to be harm uh, to, your, to you or your family. Um, that was another big problem uh, that we sometimes identified, uh, you know, uh, you know in, uh, when I was in government. Um, and then the third thing I'll just point out is, you know, this new law that was just passed, the Corporate Transparency Act, that requires reporting. Mm -hmm. doesn't just require reporting of domestic corporations, but if you are a foreign business and you register to do business in a particular U.S. state, um, you also have to file a beneficial ownership report with FinCEN uh, so that, you know, essentially you have to disclose your ownership to, uh, to the federal government. So I, th I think that's going to help, um, you know, who's behind these, these entities, uh, you know, are, are they legitimate entities, um, as opposed to what we saw with the Panama Papers where you had all these shell companies and, and nobody was able to figure out what was, what was happening with these entities. So. Yeah, I think you're right on there, Jim. Doctor, any closing thoughts you'd like to share with us? Ah. Yeah, uh, I want to talk about the, the, the organization of the criminal uh, groups. The, 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 um, the strategy of the both governments to try to, to dismantle the organizations uh, by the leaders is, is not working very well because they work as a business company and uh, they have many different parts of the organization. And this, uh, we can see this during the, the, the COVID crisis. During the COVID crisis, the, my, the migration issue, issues uh, were stopped. The, the, we don't have any people move, uh, uh, moving from Guatemala to the United States. And the criminal organizations goes to the extortion, business activities in Mexico City, Etc. 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 And also, uh, in Mexico, the government works differently depending on the state, or depending on or the, the 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 branch of the government to attack criminal organizations. And because of this, we have success in Mexico City, for example, in Yucatan, for example, etc. But we, we can see failures in some parts of the border. For example, in Monterrey, the government works very well but not in Chihuahua, not in, in, in Baja California. Uh, at the same time, uh, the, the criminal organizations are opening the border of Guatemala to his activities, to cross people and to cross drugs. Uh, and right now, some people are talking about the migrant business is, is more important than the drug business in Mexico for the, the criminal organizations. Well, thank you. That, those are very important. And it reminds me of one issue we haven't yet gotten into. It just shows how much more there is to talk about, which is impunity. Yeah. And you could have wonderful laws, but if you don't enforce those laws and bring people to justice, and if you look at some of the rankings that have been done of states in Mexico, you find a whole bunch of states with over 90% impunity rates and some up at 98 99%, which is just what you're saying. There's a, a, a big variation among states and the federal government of what's your chance that I think the national average is is 94 percent impunity yeah. so that means you kill somebody you get arrested you've got 94 percent chance of not being convicted 
and then you look at the other crimes too. So that's a problem that needs to be addressed also as we go forward. So we've touched on a whole bunch of important issues. We've, uh, I think we've just cracked open the door and we'll look forward to having further conversations with, with you and with others as we go forward. Thank you very much for being with us today, everybody. And um, I don't know, Andrew, do you want to make some closing remarks for this session and another session tomorrow? That's right. Thank you, Ambassador Wayne. Thank you all for, for being here. Thank you to our panel. Let me, let's uh, give them a round of applause. As I, as I mentioned at the outset, we're focusing throughout our conference on both bilateral, um, whoops, uh, bilateral issues as well as domestic issues, issues that, that apply specifically to Mexico. And as I mentioned, uh, tomorrow we have uh, a session where we will talk about the challenges that will face the next president of Mexico um, with three experts who have done a lot of analysis of the security situation. So please join us tomorrow online at 3 p.m. Eastern for that. And again, thank you all for being here this morning uh, in person and online, and we'll look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>